Today we have a mixture of Capitol Press Corps and other reporters from all over the state uh, ready to ask questions about the upcoming legislative session, which begins, of course, as you five should know, on March 8th. On behalf of Forum News Service, I do welcome our guests, Governor Mark Dayton, Senate Majority Leader Tom Bach, House Speaker Kurt Dowd, and we have House Minority Leader Paul Thiessen and Senate Minority Leader David Han. Format is simple, gentlemen. We ask questions, you answer them. <laughs> I have several questions from uh, some of the reporters who could not make it here. So we already have a head start with a lot of questions, and you have a lot of reporters here. So we're going to have a lot of questions. So try to keep the answer short if you can. Let me, oh, and also I should say, if, if there are reporters who aren't normally in the Capitol Press Corps, make sure you wave your hand if you want to an ask a question, because I, I'll give you folks priority over those of us who work around here all the time. Let me start with a question for each of you. Let's start with the governor and then whoever else wants to pick up after that. I want to know your top three priorities for this legislative session. Governor? Education, with an emphasis on uh, early childhood and uh, pre-kindergarten, as well as uh, higher education uh, affordability, number one. Uh, number two, transportation, a real solution that's going to uh, commit the resources necessary to make the kind of difference we need. And uh, third, water quality. Who would like to go next? Speaker? Sure. Uh, our priorities are, are pretty simple. We want to do some significant tax relief for middle class Minnesotans. Uh, we want to invest some, some resources into our road and bridge infrastructure. Uh, and then, you know, frankly, I think part of it too is, is a bonding bill that, that uh, would be heavy in uh, transportation infrastructure type projects. Those Majority leader? Uh, uh, the Senate would like to do a very comprehensive long-term transportation plan, not a funding package, a plan, a long-term plan. Uh, we feel very strongly about a very robust bonding bill, uh, some bonding uh, also supplemented by some of the one-time cash that we expect to be uh, available. And uh, in the education area, uh, expanding opportunities there uh, in K-12, uh, providing some help for school districts as it relates to the teacher evaluation program that the legislature passed in 2011, but as a mandate never funded. Uh, and in education, looking at some kind of debt relief for uh, graduates from our higher education institutions. Okay, Leader Han. I think uh, our priorities uh, for our caucus, our top priority is to do some kind of tax reform, tax relief. Uh, we think the opportunity is ripe to look at the structure of our tax code. I think we're overly dependent on income taxes, for example. This might be a good opportunity to have some discussion on that, but certainly with the surplus money is an opportunity to do some real tax relief. That's our top priority. Uh, we think uh, transportation is, a, is another item that we've talked a lot about. I think there's, again, a great opportunity to, to look at uh, repurposing some of the existing sales taxes for transportation, as the Republican plan calls for. And I think uh, the last thing in education, we'd like to see uh, uh, some real structural reform to education to make sure that we can do better at making sure uh, our kids get uh, the education they need and that they graduate. Leader Thiessen. Um well, we have lots of ideas for this session. Three this time. So the first would be what Governor Dayton said. The second would be what Senator Bach said. Uh, and the third uh, would be we'd love to see some work on campaign finance reform and making sure that all of the expenditures and all the money that's being spent in our political elections uh, are disclosed and available for the public to see. Okay, that was a softball question. Who has the real one, Bill? I think I got the switch right. We don't have this thing up on the Iron Range. Uh, Bill Hanna, Masabi Daily News. Uh, Two-part question uh, dealing with the special session that was not called. Uh, to Speaker Bach, I'm sorry, to uh, Majority Leader Bach, Speaker Doubt, and the Governor. If agreement had been reached on just extended benefits for laid off steel workers and mining related workers, which are gonna, uh, the expiration is gonna total more than 1,000 by the time the session begins. If that had been reached, 
Governor, would you have called the session and would it have passed in the Senate, Mr. Bach, and in the House, Mr. Dowd? And then the second part of that, will something be done the first week and signed into law? And, and be, be, before you start, Governor, I thought I saw in your letter the other day uh, 3,000 number of layoffs, which is more than what Bill was saying. I was talking about the expiration of that. So, so I, I would like to get a, the latest number you have also when you're talking. I don't know what letter you're referring to. Okay, you, you and the uh, congressional the delegation. delegation. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know how that number was derived, but okay, that thank was you. a consensus uh, letter. Well, I, I, uh, I, think, maybe just, I think the issue is how many are laid off versus how many have ex expended their benefits. So let, let's get to the question. Uh, you know, first of all, I would have called a special session uh, for that purpose. Uh, secondly, I take it the word, I don't want to put words in your mouth in your hand, but I believe you said you yourself would introduce a bill in the first week of the session to provide uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, the speaker said that we didn't need the special session because we could handle it in the regular session. So I uh, will submit, if it's necessary, or I urge legislators to uh, pass in, in the first week. Maybe we'll give them to the second week of a bill that would be a clean bill that would provide uh, retroactive benefits for six months to those individuals and their families. Are the microphones working? You got them? Okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> we, we are getting somebody to look at the microphones. I think you can be heard okay on live stream. I'm not sure the TV folks here can hear you, but let's go, let's go ahead. Uh, Senator? Well, uh, yeah. Senator Thomasoni sent a, uh, last week, I told Senator Thomasoni to <clears throat> get the language that him and Representative Hath Hackbarth have agreed to, <coughs> jack it up so that it's ready for introduction the first day. Uh, a set of bill jackets did come by my desk yesterday with Senator Thomasoni's signature on them, and I did sign it and send it down to Senator Saxog where I was asked to send it. So. Uh, assuming that that's the right language, there will be a bill ready for introduction in the Senate on the first day. I think, yeah, thanks for the question, Bill. We, we uh, obviously, um, I think, all care about what's going on in the Iron Range and want to make sure we're helping those folks out, not just the short term with unemployment benefits, but, but long term. I think we all know that what people want in the Iron Range isn't just an unemployment check. They want a paycheck. Um, so we can't just take a short-term approach. And yes, the House will pass. Uh, I believe that it would have passed. I can't say for sure, but I believe that it would have passed the House. We haven't counted noses. Um, but I assume that this is something that has really broad bipartisan support. So I think I'm pretty safe to say uh, it would have passed. And I expect that we will pass it uh, absolutely the first week of session. I have made that commitment uh, already numerous times. Um, we believe that it is important. Um, and we also want to talk about how we can grow uh, the, the mining industry uh, on the range and, and grow jobs on the range long term. We think that's important as well. Anyone else? All in, all done there. Kyle. To clarify there, Mr. Speaker, uh, in order to pass that in the first, uh, first week of session, does there need to be that long term discussion that you're talking about, or are you willing to pass the, the clean bill in the first week of session? No, I think we're, we're, we're fine passing a, a bill for extending unemployment benefits uh, the first week of session. Obviously, we have talked as well uh, about uh, adjusting the unemployment fund, which now has a $600 million more than it needs in it. So um, we've talked about adjusting and setting an upper trigger so we don't get those huge surpluses. Um, I don't believe that that's at all controversial. Uh, Democrats, when they controlled all of state government, did, did that same thing. In fact, they gave more of that money back um, uh, and did it when there was a smaller surplus. So I don't think that's at all controversial, uh, but we'd like to accomplish both of those things. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quick, uh, Don, it, it's the benefits that will expire by the time the session begins will be more than 1,000, probably 1,200. The number of layoffs in mining and mining related over the past year at some point has been about 3,000. And, and since you started talking about first week of session, can you legislative leaders at least quickly go through anything else that has to be done the first week of session, uh, such as um, 
some of the other things that have been talked about for spatial stations or like the real ID and go ahead speaker. Yeah, thank you, Don. Um, we have also talked, I know that the, the Senate and House and the Governor's Office are, are talking and coming to agreement on language, at least the first part of Real ID, which is repealing the, the prohibition in law so the department can look into what it takes. Um, I still maintain that if we're going to meet the deadlines in the most uh, cost-effective fashion, we need to be issuing Real ID compliant driver's licenses by October of this year. Uh, first step is to, to repeal that. Uh, our plan is to do that in the first week of session to give the department as much time as possible um, to get back to us because we have to pass yet this session uh, debate and pass the enactment language uh, to, to make our licenses uh, real ID compliant. Does everybody agree with that? Anything else in the first week of session? Okay, okay other questions? Thanks for doing this, everybody. The working group that seemed to have the most difficulty was the one concerning racial disparities. I wonder what each of you think ought to be done about that issue in this session. Maybe you can start with the governor. Well, I, I've been meeting with uh, leaders in the uh, minority communities and uh, just met this morning with Senator Champion and some people he brought in with some, some ideas. We've been developing our own, there are others. So, I mean, it's uh, still a work in, in process, but when I come out with my uh, supplemental uh, budget uh, the 15th of March, I'll have uh, specific proposals and there'll be a significant amount of resource committed, but it's not going to, I'm not going to fill up the whole amount that I'm recommending with, uh, our, with my proposals because I think the, uh, first of all, a lot of other very good ideas and our, uh, the process by which the, the people in the Communities of color can be engaged in, in formulating this this package. I think the process is is uh, needs to be as inclusive as possible, and that's going to lead to the best outcome. I, the, the one hearing that was held there were there was I believe 60 people for six hours. Tremendous interest in this, and, and that's where the the best ideas I expect will come from. Well, I, I will say, uh, Senator Dietzik, Senator Hayden, and Senator Champion have been putting a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, and they have told me they will have proposals ready uh, when session convenes. I haven't s seen the language yet. I'm not sure it's back from the revisers yet. But we're uh, absolutely looking forward to that. Uh, you know, by the time we adjourn in May, there'll be about 13 months left in the biennium. So as we look, about, look at what is uh, kind of a solution in this biennium, I think the window's pretty narrow. There's not uh, a tremendous amount of time to get money out and get it into programming that's probably going to make a big difference. But I do want to uh, congratulate the governor for the idea of creating an, uh, a, a, an office over at DEED, uh, Office, I believe, of Economic Disparities, I believe they've called it. I'm looking forward to helping craft a mission for that uh, office, putting accountability into uh, pe people that receive pro or programs that receive money there. Uh, and uh, I just think it's a great place to start. And I believe those innovative solutions to deal with this problem are gonna come from the community. And uh, so people that submit uh, innovative programming ideas and access uh, money over a deed, I think uh, it's, it's gonna come from within. I don't think we're gonna come up with the solutions in this room. Anyone else? Um, you know, we, I actually look at this very similar to the, to the Iron Range. Uh, we may need to do some things in the short term, but I don't see how you really see, solve this problem in a meaningful way without looking at it on a long-term basis. We have a problem where we have a disparity in wages uh, um, in, in the minority community um, versus the, the white community. Uh, that's a shame. Every Minnesotan should have the opportunity to participate fully and successfully in Minnesota's economy. Um, but we also have the highest achievement gap in the, in the country, which means those minority and low-income students aren't getting the same education. Uh, you look at minority students in the Minneapolis School District that have less than a 50% chance of graduating, and it's no wonder why they're not making as much money when they're out in the workforce. So uh, we can't ignore uh, what's, what's really causing the problem. You know, frankly, we're failing these kids. Um, they're not failing in the school. We're failing them. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to help these kids become and be more successful and, and be able to participate uh, more wholly in that, in that uh, uh, economy in Minnesota. So uh, we want to deal with the education uh, uh, 
issue and making sure that we're giving these kids the tools they need to be successful in their life. So it's a short term, potentially, but more importantly, a long term on this issue. Senator Han, looks like you're edging closer to the microphone. <laughs> well, I'm kind of on the end of the table here. I have to kind of edge up to it. But I, uh, I was reading the other day, uh, I was elected the same year that Governor Plenty was elected to his first term, uh, 13 years ago. And our state budget has increased 50% since that year. And our poverty situation has not improved at all. I am not convinced that doing a lot of state spending on poverty and those kinds of things has a huge effect. I think what the speaker is talking about is something that many of us talked about for a long time. We have to look at making sure that education opportunities exist for everybody, and they don't. I've, I've said that the achievement gap is an issue we love to admire because we, every year we talk about it and nothing ever changes. And I think it's time that we look at this very seriously, and I think we need to get input from the community. I think people want to be able to make sure their kids have the right or the opportunity to go to a school that is best for their needs. And we can do this, and we should do it. And I think if we do that, we will find that these, these economic numbers get better. When you have an educated workforce, these things get better. But I don't know that just spending money on some kind of government programming has shown to be very effective over the past dozen years. Representative Thiessen. Uh, well, I th I'm, thank you for the question, because I think it should be one of the top priorities that we are dealing with in this legislative session. I'm glad there was discussion of it during the special session. Um, and I think that there's a lot of things we can do that don't cost very much money. I mean, I think some of the investments that people are talking about, about and, you know, it, what we don't, we, you know, we talk about an achievement gap, really it's an opportunity gap. And because we haven't made investments in the entire community. And that's what we need to think about. Uh, and I do think that there is, this is not just about North Minneapolis or you know, parts of St. Paul. There's pockets across this state where this is an issue, and we need to rethink think about those resource inequities that exist in our state. Um, but there's some other things that we absolutely can do. Um, you know, we can talk about restoring the, felon, the right of people that have served their time uh, in prison to be able to vote and be part of our community. I think that's an important step that doesn't cost a dime that we could take uh, to move the dial on this issue. Uh, in education, you know, I think that is an issue that we absolutely need to focus. I don't think there's any disagreement from anybody up here, but there's things within our system that we need to take a look at. We need more teachers of color in, the, you know, in our schools, and we need to work very hard. Minneapolis and St. Paul are both doing some pretty good programs around that, but we need to make sure that we move the dial even further to get, uh, to get people that reflect the community in teaching positions, because that does make a big difference. Uh, I think that there's a big gap in how we discipline uh, students of color versus the general population uh, that can't just be explained by percentage in, you know, of students in the school. And I think that's something we need to take a very hard look at. And there's things that we could do policy-wise to move the dial there. I think that almost, instead of labeling kids as emotionally and behaviorally disturbed, figuring out how we actually educate them, I think is an important step that we could take that, again, wouldn't take necessarily any more money. Uh, I think teacher development and evaluation, that process, putting more money, so that's a robust system, I think, could be a really important part of that, and I hope that's part of the budget that we bring forward this year. And then there's people, um, there's programs that are working out there. I know the speaker just was at the Northside Achievement Zone earlier this week. They're doing some great work uh, in making sure that it's not just the kids, but the parents and the whole community that are surrounding these kids and moving them forward. And full service community schools, which there's pilots in Duluth and one other location, I can't remember, I think is trying to achieve and having good results doing the same thing. So I think that there's a lot we could do. And the last thing that I would say on this is Senator Jeff Hayden and I have a proposal uh, for something we're called disparity impact notes or equity notes, which would require the legislature, just like a fiscal note, but it would require on legislation that comes before the, for, before the House and the Senate to have an analysis of whether this is in, gonna increase disparities or dis decrease disparities. And that's racial disparities, socioeconomic disparities, geographic disparities, uh, and really look and have us be more intentional about thinking about that. Because a lot of the stuff we do, I think, has unintended consequences, and if we're more deliberate in our legislative process, uh, again, something that won't cost any money, but I think could go a long way to actually starting to close uh, what is a, a huge opportunity gap in Minnesota. You five may be the most powerful five people in the state, but your voices don't necessarily project that way. So the three of you in the middle especially, if you can try to make sure you're close to the mics so everybody can hear you, we'd appreciate it. 
Mary has an easy peasy question for you. <laughs> we'll see about that. Transportation was listed as a priority for all of you. It's been a priority around this place for many, many years. I want to know what each of you would plan to do differently to finally make this happen after so many years of there being demand from the public, each of you running on transportation funding. So, Governor, I'd like you to start with what you would do differently, and then the two main legislative leaders, your chairs in particular, your transportation chairs, and a public hearing recently said members need to appeal to each of you individually to get this done. So, so why is that and what are you going to do differently to actually make it happen this year? Governor? Well, I'd say there, there are two things on which most Minnesotans agree. The first is we need to uh, make a greater investment in our, improving our roads, bridges, uh, public transit. The second is nobody wants to pay for it. So, you know, I put out a proposal last year, you know, got roundly rejected. Okay, mine's out there. Uh, I want to see what others in the legislature have to, to offer. But I, I insist that it be real, that it not be, first of all, that we not gut the general fund and shift uh, $500 million of biennium out of the general fund over into for transportation. And secondly, that it provides a, continu a continuing source of secure revenue so the, the construction industry can gear up knowing that they've got a, we've got a 10-year commitment here to do what we need to do. Governor, if I might follow up, though, what might you do differently? Because waiting for their plans or staying with the same approach has not worked. What can you do to change the dynamics? I think it's their responsibility. I put it forward a year ago. I, I'm pessimistic we'll get a transportation bill meaningful. I think we'll get one that's got a lot of cosmetics. But you talk about putting real money down of the, the amount necessary to, to stop things from getting worse and then begin to build us the... Uh, highway transportation infrastructure we need, it's, it's a significant amount of money. And it's not going to come from the federal government. And it's not going to come from, you know, from all sorts of, you know, g games and gimmicks. It's going to come from, from real money. And, and until that is forthcoming from, uh, you, know, the, you know, I think the Senate uh, ha had that kind of proposal. But, it, it, you know, it's, the two are so far apart right now. Uh, I'll leave it to them. Mr. Speaker, it sounds like this is next, and the governor just said he is pessimistic. Are you about a transportation plan getting done? I'm actually very optimistic. Um, everyone here, and you said it in the beginning of your question, Mary, everyone here talked about uh, transportation being their priority. Um, let's focus on what matters, and if we do that, the funds are there to fund uh, a long-term plan that will put uh, significant money into roads and bridges over the next 10 years. I, th I think, you know, and forgive me for using a little common sense once in a while, but um, I think of this a little bit like a Venn diagram. And each one of us has a, has a circle. Uh, and somewhere there's a point where those circles overlap. Let's focus on where those circles overlap. There are controversial things about some of these transportation plans. One of them is transit. Um, it doesn't have the broad bipartisan support all across the state uh, that I think people wish that it had. That's fine. It just simply doesn't. Uh, I don't believe that it has the, the votes to pass in the House. Um, but yet everyone talks about the importance of roads and bridges. The other part that's controversial is new revenue. When we're sitting on, again, a, you know, almost a record surplus, um, the fact that we want to take more money out of the budgets of Minnesota families is just kind of beyond me. So let's focus on what matters, and let's focus and work on what we agree on. And if we do that, we can absolutely come out with a, with a transportation plan. And I frankly don't believe um, that anybody is going to hold up something, uh, funding for roads and bridges, something that is so broadly supported, not only by the public, but by bipartisan members of the legislature, uh, to get something that is controversial. Um, and I think people who try to do that will be blamed at the end of the day if there isn't a result. But you will be blamed if you in your caucus does not deliver on transportation. You ran on it. So what are you going to do I'm differently? Gonna focus, Come Mary, back to that Mary, original I'm, question. Here's What's what I'm going to do differently. Yep. I'm going to focus on something that everybody agrees on. And let's pass something that has broad agreement, something we all agree on. And you know what? I think Minnesotans would really appreciate if we did that. I understand that we have varying opinions. Uh, but let's focus on something we all agree on and let's fund our roads and bridges in a significant way, and we can do it. Okay, I, Senator Bob. Well, first and, and, of all, it okay, seems second. to me that the, that the uh, governor's assessment of pessimism is pretty well founded after hearing that answer. Um, talking about Venn diagrams isn't going to get us uh, resolved. And the fact of the matter is the Republican have not, Republicans have not put forward any plan that actually adds up. They're counting money that's already spent as new money, kind of typical Republican budgeting, I would say. But... Uh, for someone to come out here, a leader of the state to come out here and say transit is controversial, it's controversial in the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. 
but it's broadly supported by people in Minnesota. They know that we can't just build roads and bridges. We absolutely have to build roads and bridges, but if you're gonna completely write off transit, and not just in the metro area, but if you live in St. Cloud, you know, if you live in Fairmont, if you live in these, all these places and you need to get to the doctor and you're, you're you know, old and can't drive anymore or you're disabled, that's transit. That's, that's not the controversial part of the transit. That's tr well, that's, we're well, talking about the train out to the West Metro that's Well, that's not what you said, dollars. Kurt. You said well, that's, transit. That's the you said transit part. is controversial. And that's what's, you know, and if that's where the speaker is starting, uh, his Venn diagram is not gonna get us anywhere. Okay, Mr. Majority Leader, Senator Bach, the, the question I asked originally too about what are you gonna do differently, and your chairs in particular, it was Senator Dibble, transportation chair, who said, you need to appeal to our leaders to make sure this gets done. What can you do differently to get this done? Well, I guess first I would urge caution when it comes to making long-term commitments to the gen from the general fund. Uh, when you looked at, and we'll learn more tomorrow when we see uh, the, the budget forecast, but when I looked at the November one, it looks pretty rosy right now. There's, some, there's a lot of one-time money. Uh, you noticed I said comprehensive transportation plan. I didn't say a funding package because what I don't, oh, I don't want to end this session is with a bunch of one-time money out of this surplus and, and everyone go home on the campaign trail and say they've resolved our transportation needs. Uh, but I do think we need to be cautious about committing general fund money going forward. There's a reason that, that uh, transportation revenue is constitutionally dedicated. We're going to have a new legislature this time next year sitting in this room. And uh, we don't know what their priorities will be. Anything could happen that the public's priorities change. But that new legislature is going to reflect, reflect the priorities of the day. And I think over committing in the general fund in transportation and putting transportation in competition with everything else in the state budget, whether it's uh, early childhood or K-12 or higher ed or health care, putting it in competition, I think it will lose. As soon as money gets tight, and that may be in the next biennium, it will get, it will get delayed because transportation investments uh, can be delayed. So I don't think it will fare well. So I think it's got to be constitutional revenue. I don't know if it has to be gas tax. Uh, there are other pieces of revenue that are constitutionally dedicated uh, to transportation. Uh, there are sales tax pieces that are constitutionally dedicated. Uh, there are license tabs that are constitutionally dedicated. So we're, uh, we're absolutely open to have that conversation. I, I do agree with the governor that I'm pretty pessimistic if you think we're going to just sit down and negotiate a transportation finance bill and try to find an agreement. I think there are some other things uh, that maybe need to be brought into the conversation and maybe there is some kind of a package that includes transportation and other things that starts to evolve. Uh, in divided government, uh, it's really hard to run the table uh, and you, we're, both sides are gonna have to be willing to consider something that the other side wants and probably be, have to be willing to do something that they might be a little uncomfortable with to get something that they want. And so, are you, is that what you can do differently is consider some things you don't want? Well, is I, that I the think difference? That's what I, I, if we expect to get something done, I don't expect the Senate's gonna run the table and get a bunch of new constitutionally <laughs> dedicated uh, revenue for transportation and not give some considerations to something that's important to the House. And I don't know what that is, but I think that's, I think we need to take a more holistic view of the session and say what is, it, rather than talking about transportation on its own and trying to carve that deal, are there some other things we can talk about that are important to people uh, that, that lead to an agreement? Well, I'd like to just uh, weigh in a little bit on this. I, uh, I probably don't have the votes to make much of a difference in this debate, but I, I, I do think that it makes sense to think about transportation coming from the general fund. I really don't understand the argument, uh, Senator Bach, that this should not be general fund money. It is a core function of government. It's mentioned in the Constitution as we, we should provide for the roads of the state. Uh, education, education is a general fund item. Uh, to say that legislators ought not to be considering what the priorities of the state should be and make decisions, I thought that's what we were elected to do, to come down here, look at the general fund, and decide what is the biggest priority. We've all talked about or, uh, transportation being a top priority. I think it would fare perfectly fine as part of the debate on how you spend those general fund dollars. I, I, I do think that it doesn't make any sense to people outside of this room or outside of this building, this campus, 
When you talk about a $1.2 billion surplus and the need to raise another billion dollars in taxation dedicated to fund transportation, that does not make sense to people. It doesn't make sense to me. I think it's time to have that debate. And you know, I, a lot of times Republicans get accused of, well, you don't want to spend money on anything, you just want to cut, cut, cut. We're talking about, as Republicans, spending a significant amount of money. And that's not looked at, in, well, the, who cares about that? We should just raise taxes. No, we're talking about spending real money out of the general fund, taking current taxes, dedicate them to a purpose, and let's spend that money in a purpose we all agree is important. I think that's a good debate to have, and I think, to me, the biggest step that this legislature could take would be to have, begin to put in place the ability to have that discussion and see how big a priority it is and see how we can make that work. You brought up forecasts. Let's do a lightning round. Your prediction for the forecast tomorrow. Senator Hand. I think we're going to have a little larger surplus than we saw in November. Speaker. Plus two to three hundred million. Governor. A bit, a bit higher for this biennium, uh, very possibly a bit lower for the next. Majority leader. I agree with the governor. Lower. Okay. Since the sponsor of this uh, event has a lot of rural papers, I want to talk a little bit about rural issues. I think the best question came from one of my editors. What would it take to make this a successful session for rural Minnesota? And anybody can start. I'd like you all to answer. Don't all jump in there. Let, let Senator Bach, you're, you're from rural Minnesota. You can start. Well, let me try. I, uh, I have long felt uh, that the state needs to be a stronger partner with our local units of government. Uh, most uh, services in communities other than schools get delivered at the local level, county or city. And uh, it's the state that collects the big money through the income tax and the sales tax. The only real vehicle available to local governments uh, is property taxes. And so we have forced, I think the state has forced property taxes up uh, going back to 2003 uh, by not being a stronger partner. So the, the Senate is, I think, uh, it'll be a successful uh, session for rural Minnesota if the state becomes a stronger partner in helping deliver services there through additional local government aid or county program aid. I also think that uh, transportation, if we can come up with a transportation uh, plan, long-term plan for them, that'll be a successful session for rural Minnesota. Legislative leaders, this is an important election well, I, year. I would agree with the uh, majority leader about transportation. I think that's the lifeblood for greater Minnesota, and that's why, again, real dollars that are going to go out for the next 10 years is, is vital to uh, you know, their uh, prosperity. Uh, property tax release for farmers and others, I would agree with that as well. Broadband, I think that's uh, very significant for people in, in uh, rural areas. And then uh, my bonding bill helping small towns uh, in particular deal with the, some of the overwhelming costs of uh, clean water. I, w I would agree that transportation is a need that I hear, uh, and I've traveled a lot throughout the state, and uh, I think that is an appropriate focus. I think that would be considered a big win if we could uh, get something uh, done on our transportation system. But I also think uh, doing th things to improve our economic climate. Uh, we talk a lot about the struggle that rural Minnesota has, greater Minnesota. I think a lot of it is because of the need to uh, encourage investment and growth in the economy in rural Minnesota. Uh, and, and with the tax structure that we have today, uh, I don't think you can compensate for that by doing more you know, government assistance uh, to rural Minnesota. You've got to do things that help the economy grow. I think we look at our taxes. The House members have anything to say? I, I agree with the transportation uh, issue. I think if we can come out with a transportation uh, bill that puts some significant money into roads and bridges, I think that would be a success for Greater Minnesota. I also think it's important to note that Greater Minnesota has not recovered and fared as well uh, after the recession um, as the metro area. So I think uh, looking at things that we can do uh, to, to make uh, Greater Minnesota more competitive so that uh, Minnesotans can have better job opportunities out there and, and be more successful, um, I think is important. And if that means, uh, you know, uh, property tax relief for farmers or property tax relief for uh, small businesses out in Greater Minnesota, the kinds of things that are going to help our Greater Minnesota economy grow and be successful, I think we need to look into those things. Yeah, well, we... Um I've already put out a whole series of ideas about what I think we should do, a Greater Minnesota for All package. Uh, nothing particularly new, just stuff that the legislature forgot in 2015 somehow, even though it was supposed to be the year of Greater Minnesota. 
Um, so investing in LGA is absolutely something we should do. Investing in broadband grants, community grants, is something, you know, I, I have traveled a lot around the state in the last nine, ten months. Uh, you know, you hear stories all over the state about the lack of access to broadband. Businesses having to move 30 miles out of their counties to get access to broadband. Students having to drive into the local library or McDonald's so they can get access to Wi-Fi to complete their homework. I mean, this is leaving a patchwork across our state. I think the governor was absolutely right to put $100 million uh, uh, out there to invest in broadband. It's not even enough to complete the job, but with the surplus we have, and it's one-time money that we would be using, it's a great use of what we could do and would make a big difference long-term for Greater Minnesota. Um, transportation bill, of course, we need to do that uh, and uh, would help all parts of the state, including Greater Minnesota. I think dealing with oil train safety is another thing that I hear all over the state uh, and we should, you know, and we should make the kind of investments that we and as Democrats have been fighting for for the last year. Uh, a couple other things, you know, the thing that you hear most when you go to talk to, to business people and others in, in small towns and regional centers is not that they don't have the capacity to grow their business, they just can't find the workers to do it. So making a real investment in workforce housing, which was proposed to be cut last year, uh, and also connecting our higher education institutions and our high schools with our manufacturing facilities. There's a lot we can do in that that I don't think would cost very much money. You know, you go to a place like Faribault, uh, they're starting to do some really good work connecting up their high school students using and, and using the community college with their manufacturers. Uh, because one of the things you hear a lot from manufacturers is people have the wrong impression of what manufacturing is today. And they think if you could just expose students to what it actually looks like, what this high-tech manufacturing looks like today, a lot more kids would be interested. So I think that there's lots of things we can do to address, uh, to address those workforce issues, which are probably the biggest challenge, at least that I've heard from business people and community leaders across greater Minnesota that we can get after. And the last thing I think we should do is, is address this inequity that we were left with last year. Uh, you know, we, we increased money for nursing homes. We left home care workers and other people behind. You know, so there's what has been called in the past the 5% campaign. And we also, Gene Poppy from Austin has a really good idea uh, around dementia care, which I think would make a big difference. You know, here in the Twin Cities, uh, we have a lot of facilities just because of the density of the population for things like adult daycare that not just helps the person with dementia, but gives a lot of relief to that caregiver. It doesn't exist as much in greater Minnesota just because, again, of the density of the population. So putting a little bit of money to allow community centers or others to provide those kind of resources, I think could go a long way to improving the quality of life for, for Minnesotans. And, you know, the, at, the, at the end of the day, what this session really should be its priority is making sure that our economy is working for everybody. And part of that means that it's working in those parts of greater Minnesota where it's not working as well today. Other questions from the table? David? Uh, tax has been mentioned uh, a couple times, uh, this particularly for you, although others, for you, Governor, although others can jump in. Uh, last year, your tax proposals focused on middle class families. Or, do you still want to expand the working family tax credit and make more families eligible for tax credits for child and elderly dependent care? And uh, as a second part, do you plan on proposing any new tax cuts this session other than the ones that you uh, put forward uh, last session? Well, the uh, child, uh, child care credit, uh, that's uh, <clears throat> one of, uh, is, um, I think, uh, Chairman Davids for putting that in his uh, bill that's in the Commerce Committee. Uh, yes, I, I will propose, again, an uh, increase in the working uh, credit or the in income level. And um, I've got a couple other things that I'll say for next week. Otherwise, you'll have nothing to write about next week. No. <laughs> we'll find something. Taxes? Other people? No one else want? Uh, so well, I, today, the Chamber of Commerce, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, came out with their business benchmark report. Uh, three numbers I'll relate to. Small business tax index, we rank 48th. Small, uh, business property tax burden, we rank 49th. Income tax top rates, we rank 48th. We are talking a lot about how we can get the state to be stronger economically. We're talking about greater Minnesota, how we can get uh, our economy to be better across the state, and we have some of the most uh, uh, biggest impediments in the country to economic growth. This is a great opportunity we have with the surplus we have and the tax structure we have to try to address that. We should do it. You know, it's just a typical chamber hatchet job. They pick me metrics that make us look bad. That's all they present. You know, it's been interesting in the last uh, few months about national uh, organizations that look uh, at us objectively 
and without this kind of, you know, prejudice against the state and the kind of pol policies we have, the rank is, you know, number one for business, uh, number uh, five, number one for job creation, number five for job creation. You know, I mean, there are all these other factors that they just want to exclude, and they pick a metric. You know, the last year, our economy, economic growth has flattened out. Is for one because we don't have the workforce. GDP growth is is labor hours plus pro, uh, time and productivity, and uh, you know we, we, we the flattening of our workforce, lack of availability, is really going to limit our economic growth. And if you look at the last five years, you get a very different picture because we we, we spurted ahead faster than most other states in the recovery, and so now you know, we, as I say we've reached a, a certain ceiling. So you know I just really. I'm going to hear this, I'm sure, for the next, you know, five months or longer. But it's just, you know, the chamber never has anything good to say about the state of Minnesota, and they're wrong for that reason. Speaker well, Doubt, looks like you have some doubts about that. You know, I just, to listen to the governor of our state say that, to call something the chamber, the, the association that represents the businesses who employ Minnesotans and, 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 and do a great job at employing Minnesotans, to, to hear him call that a hatchet job when they're literally presenting the facts, you know, I think I think we as elected officials owe it to Minnesotans to listen to the people who in Minnesota provide jobs and good paying jobs. And, and we need to as elected officials not, I get really sick of people who wanna pit this group of people against that group of people for their own political gain. You know what, I, I've been saying this recently, but I wish that we would spend two years not focused on how to get more revenue into the state of Minnesota, but how do we get more revenue into Minnesota family budgets? Let's talk about what we can do to grow Minnesota's economy um, and, and, and increase participation by all Minnesotans in the success of that economy. Um, and, and, you know, to think that this group or that group is, is you know, trying to create something that's not true because, I mean, it's just, it's, it's foolish. Well, Mr. Speaker, since you brought that up, I mean, uh, here's a quote from you, you, you said at the Twin City Chamber, you said, uh, talking about uh, early childhood and uh, pre-kindergarten uh, through the schools, you said this proposal wasn't pur pushed by school districts, wasn't pushed by parents, this was pushed by the teachers' union. If you haven't done the math, it's really easy to figure out why. You increase the dues paying members of the teachers' union by 8, 10 percent, Democrats get about two-thirds of their money for their campaigns from unions. So now the, the, the future- And I stand right by oh, it, Governor. Well, okay. So, <laughs> so, so the reason to oppose universal pre-K is because it's going to add more Democrats to the, the voting rolls. We're not looking at what 47,000 kids could benefit from. No, Governor, the reason to oppose it is because it doesn't show that it closes the achievement oh, yes, it gap. No, wrong. it doesn't. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah, and what we did together, studies, Governor, in a bipartisan studies. fashion last session does show that it closes the achievement yeah, gap. And you and I did it together. So, you know, we can focus on uh, things that are divisive, and we can focus on things that school districts are not asking for, or we can actually solve the problems that are proven to close the achievement same, gap. Same, well, we disagree. We can swap studies, but you know, there's just that's just not that's just wrong to say that uh, early childhood and, uh, and universal pre-K doesn't doesn't close the achievement gap. It's one of the most important things we can do, and to put, tribute that, say we're not going to do that because it's going to add more members to the teachers' union, is, contradicts what you just said about not being divisive and being respectful of different groups that have legitimate agendas. You know, I don't think the Minnesota Chamber, organi the, the, I think the Minnesota Chambers around the state, we've seen this with the transportation, again and again disagree with their, the, the parent organization. I don't think that parent organization ran this uh, evaluation by its members. I think they've got a, a cadre in, in that uh, central statewide office that's just dead set against anything that we do. I'll stand by that, you stand by yours been a lot of talk about helping rural Minnesota and what kind of tax policy could be proposed that will help rural Minnesota. I can just tell you, tax policy by itself is not going to rebuild rural Minnesota's economy. I was the author in 2003 of Governor Plenty's tax-free zones bill, and I was hopeful. I was really hopeful, but what we learned was it really didn't do much. And I give Governor plenty of credit, at least, and I was the author. We tried something, but we got to learn from those mistakes. And the, and, and the interesting thing I learned is even total tax-free environment, totally tax-free for 12 years, did not drive an economic recovery in rural Minnesota. And 
So that's not gonna be the thing that helps rebuild main streets in rural towns. Now I'm sensitive to, to property tax relief for, for small businesses on main streets. It's an increase in burden for them because these big box stores are moving closer and closer to their markets. We just lost a grocery store in Aurora. We lost the, the pharmacy earlier this summer. And that's happening all across rural areas. Uh, so I'm very sensitive to the property tax issue as it relates to small towns and main streets. But you have to be very careful when you talk about reforming property taxes because the burden shifts around the community. When you, when you reduce somebody, someone else picks up the tab. So it's very, very complicated. And I actually don't think it's beneficial to the state to provide property tax relief that ultimately goes to the bottom line in Bentonville, Arkansas, or to John Menard in Wisconsin. Uh, I just, I, I think we have to be very careful when we start talking about these big businesses with big square footage uh, who pay a lot of property taxes. Tax policy should help drive uh, economic recovery. And, it, and I just think tax policy by itself is not, history I think has shown very recently that it is not going to be the thing that rebuilds main streets and rural towns. Thank you. Governor, Speaker, do you have anything else you'd like to say to each other? We, we uh, also, you know, and, 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 and the, our primary focus, frankly, is, is some tax relief for middle class Minnesotans. I mean, we're one of, I think it's seven states, I might be wrong on that number, but I think one of seven states that taxes Social Security income, charges state income tax on Social Security income. We think it makes sense to, to exempt that income. Let's give our, every senior in the state of Minnesota a raise. Uh, we think those kinds of things are things that are broadly supported by Minnesotans and will help our state's economy and, and help Minnesotans uh, be more successful. Mr. Speaker, you, you use that rhetoric, but the, all of uh, Social Security income is, is, is exempt, to use your word, is not taxed for those at the lower income level. Uh, it's partially taxed uh, at the uh, next level and then taxed at the same rate as the feds, 85% at the top, top level. So your, your proposal, in the way, is, is, is you talk about help giving every senior a raise. You're not helping those in the middle, uh, lower middle and, and uh, lower income levels. I would agree with you that that middle category ought to be raised. The income ought to be raised there. So that we're giving more targeting. You, you talk about middle class, and I agree with you about that. We're targeting the, the benefit to middle income uh, seniors, but to say that we're going to get everybody raised when is just not factually correct. Another question from rural Minnesota. Uh, turning to income tax reform, uh, there are two proposals from legislators near the Brainerd area that made it into the uh, conference uh, committee um, for the tax reform bill. Um, one would um, make uh, $20,000 in military pensions exempt uh, from the state income tax, and another one would um, gradually phase out uh, the tax on Social Security income. So I wanted to see how you guys felt about those proposals. I, I'm in favor of that. Well, it's easy for my friends on the other side of the aisle to spend money. Uh, but, you know, spending in the tax bill is no different than spending in any other bill. And uh, a total exemption of social income tax on Social Security, once it's phased in, would cost about $600 million a year. We just don't have that kind of money sitting around uh, to do that. I don't think, I think it does little or nothing to drive any kind of economic recovery in these rural towns that I think most of us agree we have to try and, and do something for. Tax policy should be focused to drive economic recovery and, and I don't think Social Security does that. On the military pay, it was me in 2008 that negotiated with Governor Plenty a tax credit for uh, military veterans that have pension income, uh, but it was income sensitive. And I support that. And if people want to talk about building on that tax credit, I think it was $1,000 or $1,500 uh, of, a, of a tax credit that they would get. I'm willing to have that conversation. But to just universally exempt people's income from taxes, regardless of whether they need it or not, I, I don't think is good tax policy. I think uh, it's illustrative maybe of where some of our debates are when we talk about tax relief to allow people to keep more of their money and Democrats talk about it as spending state resources. Uh, there's, there's a disconnect here. Uh, we think it's a good thing. 
that people need to keep the resources that they earn, especially when we've got a $1.2 billion surplus. We are over collecting already. This is a good thing to do. We ought to do it. I just got to point out that we have raised tax rates, income tax rates, only on the top 2 percent of Minnesota uh, income tax payers. The, the other rates have not been raised uh, since uh, the, about the year 2000. So, you know, you, t you talk about the, we have the surplus because of the, the tax on the 2 percent, which brought $1.6 billion last biennium and a little more of this biennium. If you want to, you know, argue that one about the, the benefit of that, which the last uh, biennium helped us to erase uh, the projected deficit and fund all day kindergarten. And I, I appreciate that the wealthiest uh, Minnesotans have been willing. Uh, maybe they don't like it, but uh, you know, their additional contribution has made a huge difference for, and, and our economy has grown during that time. But the, we cut, in fact cut income taxes uh, through federal conformity by $500 million for over a million Minnesotans in 2014. That, that's, that's never mentioned. So, you know, this notion we raise everybody's income taxes, again, one of these broad statements that just isn't factually correct. I have another question from the Greater Minnesota newspaper, and it applies to everybody, I think. How do you propose to deal with prison overcrowding? Does the private prison in Appleton uh, fall in your um, plans? Does the state need to build more cells? Should sentences be shorter? In some cases, should some crimes not have prison sentences? And while we have time left, we are running low and there are a lot more questions, so let's keep the answer short, unless you want to get in an argument again. <laughs> who, who wants to start? Well, there, there was just, I think yesterday, a hearing on this very subject, and uh, there are some suggested reforms in the sentencing guidelines uh, that might reduce prison populations. I have not read the report. I know Senator Latz has been uh, putting a lot of energy into it. Uh, I think it's a conversation worth having uh, where we have nonviolent offenders, maybe the better way uh, to rehabilitate them rather than lock them up behind razor wire is maybe to get them some mental health counseling and maybe it's a different type setting than just behind bars. Their mental health is contributing, and drugs are contributing to a lot of our prison population. And I think mental health and, and drug abuse oftentimes are very linked. And we're not, uh, by just purely locking people up, I don't think we address the driver that, that maybe put them in the situation they're in. So I think there's a lot of work to do around that subject. But I can tell you what, it's really tough politics, because it writes really tough literature on the campaign trail. And you talk about reducing sentences for anybody. Let's all just be honest about that. But it's still a conversation I think uh, we, we need to go down the road and start to have. Just, just on the bricks and mortar, I think um, you know, we have a, a prison sitting completely empty, as it has been for some time. It's, it's new. Um, you know, I don't think it makes a, a bit of sense for us to build anything anywhere until we utilize what we already have. And, and I understand it's a privately owned prison. If, if we believe it needs to be operated by the state, then we can lease it or purchase it or whatever. But uh, letting that sit empty um, while we talk about constructing new cells elsewhere, I think is just a non-starter, and I don't think it makes any sense. So uh, let's utilize the resources we've got. We can work that out. And Governor, you did not include that in your prison, your bonding bill. Do you accept the Appleton prison? Well, we have, we have the building out of uh, facilities, as uh, Commissioner Roy is recommending. I don't, uh, I would agree, I don't think building a new prison, first of all, is not going to solve our immediate problem. It's going to take you know, several years to construct, then you got to operate it and the cost of that. I mean, we are bursting at the seams, but I think we got to look at, at a variety of, of measures, and I agree with Senator Bach, it's going to be extremely difficult to do this session, just like the sex offender issue is going to be extremely difficult to deal with. Uh, but, you know, you take the, I was kind of surprised the Sentencing Commission talked about reducing sentences for the, the highest level or the worst of uh, drug, drug offenses, when in fact the the, the, the ones that are at the lowest level uh, is about four, be, is reducing those sentences would free up about 400 beds. So I, I think there's some measures that could be taken and, uh, you know, combined with, uh, you know, parole and supervision and treatment that would uh, significantly relieve the, the, the serious overcrowding that we have right now. So the only thing Go I want to say on that, 
um, you know, I'm not sure that it's the best policy for the state of Minnesota to be paying a private corporation to lock Minnesotans up. And I think that's, that is a serious problem. If we're going to move on Appleton, we ought to buy the prison and run it ourselves. Uh, uh, and the second thing is, you know, I'm hearing rumors uh, that Representative Cornish is putting a, a very cynical bill together, um, basically to provide some funding for economic disparities relief and tie that to something that that community doesn't want, which is to lock more of their people up. And I hope that Representative Cornish and the Speaker allow us to have a straight up and down vote on both of those things instead of this kind of cynical politics that we've seen uh, too often here at the State Capitol. The man who drew, well, I don't know if he drove the furthest, but probably has another question, and we'll get right next to him next time. Thanks, Bill. Don. I'll, I'll play that card any time. I appreciate it. Uh, this question is probably mostly for the DFL uh, leaders, including the governor, uh, dealing with PolyMet, which is now uh, hopefully a determination of adequacy comes down this week from the DNR. That's what it's scheduled to do. If it does, then it's permitting time. Uh, environmental groups, have you guys been lobbied in any way regarding this session as far as PolyMet? I've been lobbied by people who are for PolyMet. I've been lobbied by people who are against PolyMet. I'm asking those against it if there's been any lobbying for any type of legislation or anything that would delay not, the I'm project. I'm sorry, not for legislation. I've been lobbied on both sides of right. the question, but not, I have not had anybody approach me about legislation. I, I have not either. Nor have I. Uh, the end of next week is the current plan. It's plan under, under final review now. I won't stake my life on that, but that's the intent as of right now. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so I will make my question somewhat short. Obviously, we've touched on uh, the we've touched on the surplus quite a bit today. And what I want to ask, very short and simple question: uh, What is your top priority for what you hope is done with the surplus this legislative session? So anybody can answer that. Tax relief. Yeah, same. Education. Well, I think there are, there's two pots of money. There is one-time money uh, that I would like to use for, you know, transportation and our economic stimulus uh, in, like, a, uh, inv additional investments in uh, a bonding bill to enhance the size of the bonding bill. So there's the one-time money. And then on the ongoing money, I think it's just too early for us to comment on doing things that have spending in the tails until after tomorrow. But the November forecast showed uh, about $400 million of new money in the tails uh, available when you consider inflation uh, that as MMB determines it. So uh, some caution on what the priorities are uh, going forward, I think, with ongoing spending. I just don't have a handle on yet, but I really do want to help school districts out. Uh, with probably some of the first ongoing money with this teacher, because I support the teacher evaluation program. Uh, it's a very large mandate, and I think we need to figure out how uh, to help school districts implement that. Well, I just, you know, I, I think there's, it's hard to say that there's one priority because we have a lot of work to do in the state. Um, what I would say is, though, I hope our focus is on uh, dealing with, I think, the issue that most Minnesotans feel right now, which is this economy is rigged against them and that we take steps with the surplus to balance that playing field so the economy is starting to work for everybody again. Uh, you know, it still just works for too few people. Uh, a lot, growing number of people, but there's too many people left out. And so when you have discussions about what our tax policy should be, I hope that's what the focus is. What's gonna actually balance the playing field for most people? When we talk about economic development, again, uh, where are those parts of the state where we really need to make those investments? I mean, that's why on the first day of session, we ought to suspend the rules and take up um, the relief for the Iron Rangers. The speaker already made that commitment to members of our caucus, so I would expand, we will suspend the rules. So I would expect to hear that bill on the very first day. I have a couple, hopefully, short questions, short answers from my Forum News Service colleagues. Number one, there's talk about changing seasonal property taxes this year. Anything, anything happening there? Anybody? Lots of blank looks. <laughs> my, uh, my understanding is that's kind of wrapped up with the uh, uh, statewide business property tax issue. I think uh, uh, there's a need to at least maybe get rid of the automatic escalator that we have built into that thing. I think there's a lot of interest in that. That to me is one of the options that we could look at in terms of tax relief. And I would hope we take a look at it. But not eliminate it. 
uh, well, I, if, if possible, I don't, you know, I'm, 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 I think we need to do tax relief. Okay. The other question, especially interesting in light of this week's news of that big, big head carp that was caught in the Minnesota River, do you have any plans to deal with uh, aquatic invasive species? I don't believe we have a, a new initiative. I believe it's continuing to do what, what, we're, what we've been doing, what DNR is doing, which you know, in, involves uh, in, intervening er, as early as possible in, in the waters, but also it requires the cooperation of Minnesotans, especially with the uh, mussels and the others that get transported by, by boats. I mean, we just have got to keep bringing this to the public's attention. Because uh, DNR can't do it by itself. It's got to have everybody uh, recognizing their shared responsibility. Let me give you some red meat. Uh, getting our arms around these invasive species and how they're getting into more and more lakes. One of the contributing factors is we have too many boat landings. We are going to have to put infrastructure in at the state's boat landings where more, more boats or all boats are inspected, maybe washed. But right now, today, it's just too expensive. I, I uh, actually tried a few years ago, back in 2010, I think, to put, a, to put a moratorium. I had a bill to put a moratorium on the building of more boat landings on lakes that have none right now. So we can start to get our arms around how we're going to deal with this problem. Or this problem is only going to get worse. We do not lead six, eight, ten boat landings like many lakes have. The cost of the infrastructure to do the enforcement we need to do at the boat landings is cost prohibitive. So that is incredibly controversial because the DNR's position has always been to open up more access and more access to the water. Well, if we're going to protect the water, we've got to find a way to install technology at the boat landings so that boats that come in and leave are clean. And uh, so I'm absolutely willing to consider that. Uh, I know uh, lake associations, I think, support that. They do a lot of the volunteer work at the boat landings today, trying to make sure the boats are clean when they come in or go out. But it sounds like you're saying the chances this year are slim on that? Well, it's, you know, there's, it's only 10 weeks, right? But uh, I know it's a, it's a huge paradigm shift for the DNR. And I think uh, if it's a good idea, it'll take a strong push by the DNR to make it happen. And I don't sense, at least today, that they're there. Just remember when we talk about 10 weeks, the whole budget of, you know, however many billion dollars it is was basically ne negotiated in all its details in about 10 days at the end of last session. So 10 weeks seems like a lot of time to get a lot of work done to me. Thank you. Anybody have questions from around the table who has not asked yet? You ask one. Let me check. Bill? Yes. <clears throat> This transportation issue keeps on coming up. Two-pronged question, first for Governor Dayton and Majority Leader Bach, and then for, for Speaker Doubt. First part of the question, is there any way that this can be done without a gas tax increase so, to fix the problem long term, which you're talking about, uh, Mr. Leader? And Speaker Doubt, for you, is there any way that you might agree to some sort of a tax increase to fix the transportation problem? Well, the, the, the road construction industry says that in order to really gear up and to address the, the scope of the problem we have all over the state, uh, they need the assurance that it's going to be revenue not just this year when we have a budget surplus, but uh, for the next decade. So they, they made the point to me that assured funding, a secure source, is, is essential to if they're adding crews and equipment like to do it what needs to be done um, those who don't want to raise the gas tax you know you should figure you should tell us uh, truthfully how they're going to you know generate the six billion dollars or you can quibble over that number but six billion dollars over ten years to uh, to do what needs to be done just to basically maintain and, and so slightly improve our, our current conditions. If we if we do nothing, it'll get worse. If we do something in, in, inadequately, it will get worse, and that's just just the guarantee. So you know, where where does that revenue come from? If not a gas tax, I I, I can't I can't say. You, you come out of the general fund. You can shift money that's in now in the general fund over the the uh, sales tax on on auto auto parts. 
is one proposal. That's $500 million a biennium uh, and, 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 and continuing. So you know, there's just you know, there's no free lunch. It's going to come from somewhere, and you can shift money from here to there, or whatever. But the question is, uh, Minnesotans, you know, do you, do you are you willing to pay one way or the other for for what we need to get done, or are you are you willing to just live in a state where our, our highway infrastructure, roads and bridges continues to get worse, more inadequate, and uh, businesses you go to New Ulm and businesses there who have trucking uh, businesses, you know, can't get on Highway 14 to to get uh, their 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 uh, products to, to market. So, you know, this affects, uh, that's where the Minnesota Chamber, uh, that's where the individual chambers, especially in Greater Minnesota, really really understand this this problem and the need for, for additional revenues in ways that uh, the state chamber uh, igno you know, really ignores. So you, Governor, don't see any way of doing it really properly without a gas tax I'm increase? I'm open to ears. I mean, again, you can shift money from the general fund over there. And uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a valid you know debate that we should ha be having. Can we afford to shift 500 million dollars a year, or some significant part of that, uh, from the general fund and to, to uh, dedicate it for for transportation? Um, you know, what is what kind of hole does that leave? Not now while the economy is improving, but what the kind of hole does that leave when eventually, mm -hmm. uh, and almost certainly over the next decade, there's going to be another another recession? You know, I mean, Minnesota, the gas. Uh, Price of gas now is a dollar forty something. Most places I see, uh, that's about seven hundred dollars a year of, uh, of, of a tax cut of additional money that's going into the pockets of people who drive. Uh, I I can appreciate how valuable that money is to them, and that nobody wants everybody wants to keep all of that. But it, you know, if Minnesotans are, were paying a dollar forty nine a gallon for gasoline, it, it, I would say, I'll say to them. You know, if you're not willing to pay 20 cents a gallon more, as long as the price stays low, there should be some kind of cap or ceiling or phase out if it gets above a certain amount, just back to three, four dollars a gallon, that's a different matter. But if you're not willing to pay a dollar 69 for a gallon uh, versus a dollar 49 in order to make our highways better, <laughs> you know, I think that's a mistake. But that's a decision that Minnesotans as a, as a body politic really need to make. And really need to say, are we willing to pay uh, one way or the other for the kind of improvements that, that we that everybody understands we, we need to make? And there's just there's no there's no fictional way out of that. Is there any we, way, Senator Bach, of of doing this without a gas tax increase? And and then to the speaker. And we, we're running really low on time, so please keep the well, answers really I'll, short. I'll, I'll just say, sure, there's a way to do it without our gas tax. The question just is, how robust a transportation plan do you want to build? I think there is uh, some agreement that it's about $600 million a year we need over the next 10 years. Uh, if you're going to do something that big, it gets very, very tough to do it without a gas tax. There, uh, you know, there's other constitutionally dedicated sources of revenue uh, that you can consider. Uh, but getting up to a $600 million, which I think there's agreement we should do, probably pretty difficult. But a, more, a less robust uh, proposal, you could do something without a gas tax. Uh, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll shorten your, your process here. I'm, I need to leave <laughs> in order to uh, see the first woman promoted to a Brigadier General in the Minnesota National Guard. So you're going to leave before the Speaker starts an arguing, a little bit of argument there. Well, I, would, I wouldn't miss an argument with the Speaker. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you can go. I, um, I, we're real quickly and sure, yeah, and I can I can make it quick. Um, you know, I think obviously the as I said at the beginning, um, the, the the rail transit piece of this is controversial, and the new revenue piece of it's controversial. And the reason that the new revenue piece of it is controversial is because we have uh, a huge surplus uh, in the in the general fund right now. Um, read the Constitution; it literally says that roads and bridges are a constitutionally defined core function of state government right up there with education and public safety. Um, we have the resources to pay for this. If we focus on what matters, roads and bridges, the funds are there, and we can solve it. I want to thank you five gentlemen for being here. A big thank you to Senate Media Services and Senate Sergeant at Arms that set up a lot of this. We have a forum news service. Thanks for coming.